like to uh, go ahead and get started and welcome James here with us today. We're glad to have him here and I think we're all in for uh, a great opportunity. Just want to get to your seats. We can go ahead and get started. We uh, are very lucky to have James here. James is a graduate of BYU, Harvard, and Oxford as well. Um, so he's a very well-educated man. He has three children and he lives in Provo. James has started his own company in 2001. Uh, it was Clearlink, and that was right at the, the end of the, the dot-com bubble and um, several other major uh, negative factors in the economy, so hopefully we'll talk about that. And then later on, and he uh, became the CEO of Clark Partners, and he's uh, currently works there now, and they oversee a, a portfolio of about seven different companies that they help grow. Um, kind of a cool story about James, on our way into this today when I met him, I was walking with him and getting to know him a little bit. He stops, and I'm thinking to myself, is he tying his shoe? And I look over and he's picking up some garbage actually off the campus, a pop bottle. Here's this man who's a guest in our, our home, and we, uh, we owe it to him because here he is trying to make this place better, and we didn't even go to school here. That's the kind of person he is. And I was very impressed with that. And after we've been around with him, he's a, a very high, high quality individual. So let's, let's give it up for James. Okay, we're good. Okay, the mic's on. Thank you. Thanks so much, Austin. Mike, thank you very much for having me today. And your, your board, James Davenport, that's here as well, thank you very much. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm thrilled to be here at Utah State, and I need to tell you, um, it's been a long time since I've been here, since um, I, I had a brother that was attending school here, and I came to visit, and, and I got to see all these great things. I heard, got to hear, in fact, I got a list from my wife. She said, don't come back without squeaky cheese. Does anybody know what squeaky cheese is? Okay, so that's a, that's a Utah State thing, kind of a Logan thing. Um, don't come back without being a true Aggie. <laughs> Is that, can I do that without her? No. Okay, all right, I won't do that. Um, listen, thanks so much for having me um, today. I'm, uh, you know, I grew up in Rexburg, Idaho. I grew up in a sm much smaller town than, than Logan, but a college town nonetheless. So I love these um, college towns that are set in these beautiful settings right here. My wife reminded me as I said, hey, I was on the phone with her and I said, I'm coming into the Logan Valley. And she said, sweetie, it's the Cache Valley. You need to understand this. You need to understand where you are. I'm just a farm boy from Rexburg, Idaho. Uh, growing up where the, as a 12 year old, they would throw what God's smelliest creation was, was a rotten potato into the potato trucks where I was working. Um, while all my friends uh, wanted to be the next Michael Jordan, I just wanted to own the bulls. I was always about business for some crazy reason there in little old Rexburg, Idaho. I had, we were certainly the, the have-nots amongst the haves, and I had some great entrepreneur mentors for me as I was, as I was growing up. Um, listen, I, I, I want to tell you, if, um, first of all, and, and, and as we talk about a few of these things, I know you have a little card in front of you that says, what are the five things that you're learning from this? I hope I can offer more than five things today. If I haven't given you more than five things to learn, I failed. So let me just talk to you a little bit about um, my background and sort of how I got from there to here. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about these uh, top consumer brands and some of the brands that I've worked with over my career. And just to give you a sense of what I've done over the last 20 years, um, you know, Austin mentioned this in, in the introduction, and uh, you know, I, I told him to give the short version. I think that was the longer version. You know, um, you know the joke about how you know a guy went to Harvard or not? Do you know that joke? Um, he'll tell you. So you didn't actually need to tell everybody else. I would have told everybody. It's not the same with Oxford. You don't tell people that you went to Oxford. Don't hold that against me. Um, but we were really fortunate in 2001. Um, I didn't know quite how fortunate because we started this business in a time of an economic real difficulty, a time when we couldn't raise capital. It was six weeks after 9-11. You know, the, the capital markets were completely dry because the dot-com bubble or the dot-bomb bubble had just burst. So there's no capital to be had. Nobody believes in the internet any longer um, because of all these overvalued companies. And yet I'm des I've decided that I'm gonna start an internet company. 
What business did I have doing that? And why was I so fortunate? Why am I telling you here right now that I was fortunate in doing that? We didn't know how fortunate we were, but what took place as we started that company was that it completely cleared out the competitive landscape. Uh, those that were selling on the internet, those had, that had products and services on the internet went away. So lo and behold, this little Clearlink company out of Salt Lake City becomes a, a, a real company in a short amount of time simply because the rest of the competitive landscape has just been wiped out. So we didn't raise any money. We didn't go this sort of a traditional route of, okay, we're gonna go raise an angel round and a, and a, a venture round and then go into a growth round and those kinds of things. We, we really feel fortunate now, but then it was, it was really painful to try to figure this out. And so I'm, I'm starting this business. I'm engaged to my, my dream girl. Um, she was the number one seller of Oxycontin legally in the country. So she had a great living and she was able to sort of fund this business. So we started this in, in her basement of the home that she had just sort of um, rehabilitated and, and, and built out. And I'm, I'm crashing on, you know, on, on a card table in her basement starting this business. Well, we were able to do that. And my goal in starting this business was to sell, and I think I told the group earlier as we were sitting in a round table, 13 of these satellite dishes a day. And if I could do that, I was, I, I was sitting pretty. That was our goal. That's all we wanted to do. And if I did that, I would, I would be making about a half a million dollars a year. And for a person like me, that was great. That was gonna be a great income, but that's all I wanted to do. And it's funny how goals adjust. Um, it was in, it, it, we, we really couldn't have gotten to that point, however, had we not met a group called Odyssey Web. And they handle these, these kinds of brands. And as we start talking about brands, this was the first brand that we started working with. I had a previous relationship in a previous startup where we were selling satellite dishes door to door. Uh, terrible business for, for a guy like me. I had four partners, we all had the same skill set and we were all sort of doing the same thing. I felt like I was doing the lion's share of the work and I thought I'll go out and do this on the internet. But we had a great relationship with them so instantly we had client number one. It took us, um, several years before we added these additional clients. And how we uh, got a, a client like a Mrs. Fields or a career builder or brands like Pepsi was, we acquired into them. We met this Odyssey web group and they did such a good job for us um, on a cost per acquisition basis. So they only got paid when we got paid. They were only successful if we were successful, right? And that was the kind of relationship of alignment that we created. And I think that's one of the things we did really well from the beginning was created alignment and we were able to work with these great brands and they had this great agency mentality, if you will. So work comes in, they finish it, work goes out, right? So it was really this quick turnaround for everything that we were doing and created a great environment for sort of the startup company to provide great services for excellent brands, right here. Clear Lincoln in 2014, so last year finishing, finishing up, um, you know, and, and you fast forward from when we started in 2001, it, it's been on the Inc. 500 list perpetually, it's been one of Utah's best companies, on and on and on, generating millions of subscribers over its, over its life as a company. But the thing that we're most proud about, I think, with, with a clear link, is the culture there. So we're able to do really fun things, and I think, who was it, where are you, that we talked about the culture. You've worked at ClearLink. It's, it's different, isn't it? Yes, well, that's kind of you, and we really appreciate that. But it's something that we work really hard. And, it, and what I said as we were talking about that is that this culture had to be something very authentic. You can't try to follow a Google culture. You can't try to follow an Apple culture. You can't try to follow a culture of one of these great and respected brands. You have to make it your own. And you have to make that an authentic culture. And that's how we were able to attract brands like DirecTV that came, came through in sort of our second year. Um, then ADT took us another couple of years to, to gain an ADT as a brand. AT&T and then CenturyLink and on and on to, to there are about 30 plus brands that are represented by ClearLink today. Now the interesting thing is you look at a ClearLink there probably aren't many of you, unless you've worked there, that would even know what ClearLink is. I mean, ClearLink is even answering the telephones as if they are ADT or DirecTV or Dish Network or one of these brands. And so that creates a challenge, 
right, as we're talking about brands today, it creates a bit of a challenge because how do you build brand equity in a company that really nobody, unless you're working there, would know about? Right? It's not something that you know, a great big private equity or a great big strategic is going to come in and say, hey, that Clearlink company, we know all about them. And we know this brand, and we hear it on the streets, and it's you know, the, the Clearlink Center where the jazz play. It's just not. It's just not one of those brands that you would see. But being able to leverage these brands is certainly what was the most important thing for a company like Clearlink to do. And that's how we were able to build value. But for me, as an entrepreneur, that wasn't enough. I always wanted to build my own brand. And what I do today, and just kind of fast forwarding into to some of the things that we do now, um, allow us to start to build our own brands and to take great products, great people, couple them together, and build brands that you may know out there. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some of these brands, OK? And I really want to leave a lot of time open for Q&A today. Um, forgive me if I'm, uh, uh, as, as we go through this, because I want to go fast so that we can, uh, so I can hear from you and answer any questions you might have. Um, let's see. Oh, I've, I, I've got to ask you some questions. Is that OK? So I'm going to give you the answer. And then I want to know, let me just, we'll play this out. And this will make a little bit more sense, OK? Let's see if I can look at the screen here. So do you know who invented the tissue paper in 1924? What's, what's the brand name you would associate with that? Kleenex. Kleenex. That one's easy, right? OK, so I, I didn't give you the answer in that one. I'm going to give you the answers in the rest of these, OK? So we're clicking through Kleenex. You guys got that right. Who invented the personal listening device? What? No, you're right. It was Sony. <laughs> it's a Walkman, right? You guys knew that. There's some that know in this class, right? But those of this generation might think that it's a Sony, right? Let's go to the next question. Again, I'm going to give you the answer. OK. Who invented the soft drink? Did you know that it was? Have you guys ever heard of Dr. Joseph Priestley? No? Who, who, would you, who do you think of when you think of a soft drink? Can I have a Coke? Right. So a Coke, right? Yeah, I lived in Atlanta, Georgia for a summer. Everything was a Coke. What kind of Coke do you want? I'd like a root beer. You know, that's, that's how powerful that brand is right there. But nobody knows Dr. Joseph Priestley, right? Next question. Here we go. Who invented the running shoe? 1920, the Richings Company. Everybody, anybody ever heard of the Richings Company? Anybody wearing any Richings shoes? Who do you think of when you think of running shoes? For sure. For sure. It's Nike. Completely. Um, but that was to help with the Boston Marathon back in the 1920s. They started wearing rubber shoes. Heaven forbid, rubber shoes. Rubber soles, not leather, right? Um, next question. Who invented the smartphone? Did anybody know it was IBM? Joint venture with one of the baby bells. Anybody knows? Who is it? Who do you think of when you think of a smartphone? Yeah. Exactly. Again. And finally. Who invented the action cam? I want to hear it. That's, oh, really? There you go. I want to show you something. Let's, let's go to our clip, if that's OK. Yeah, of course you're going to think of GoPro. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you why. We're going to talk about this for just one moment, OK? We've got a little clip here. Thank you. Master of Ceremonies Jim is taking care of us. Going to show us a clip. All right. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you. So, so let's go back, let's to, go this back to this for a second. Who invented, Who invented the, invented action, the action, cam? action cam? You still don't you still know, right? Know, right? We, we saw, saw Dr. Priestley, right, right, that we'd right, never heard of. Probably most of you haven't heard of an, a contour camera. But let me just tell you, when Nick Woodman was still taking stills, you know Nick Woodman, founder, CEO of, of GoPro, Woodman Labs, was still taking still pictures on his little wrist camera that was built like a box, right? Um, this company right here was out there with an underwater, did you see the little GPS on the side there? The little GPS where it would track how fast they were going, the elevations where they were going, that seems pretty cool. A little revolutionary, did you see the little smartphone connected into the, into the camera? Again, that, it, it was a first of a kind, it was a first kind of camera in 1080p, in that wireless, in that GPS, all those things. But what do you guys know? GoPro, of course you do. And you know why? Because they marketed and outmarketed this contour company in every way. And they did a great job. Think about five years ago though, okay? So go back, some of you are in high school, some of you are doing other things, some of you are, think of five years ago, end of 2010, let's say, for, just for a moment. Do you remember GoPro? Was that part of your life? No, but they did what I want to talk to you about. They created a category. These are category creators. All these in this slide that we talked about. Kleenex, category creator, right? Apple, category creator. Good friend of mine that's, that's got a wall in his office and he's a serious brand guy. He runs a company called Zango. If you've ever heard of Zango, they're serious about brands and building that. On his wall, He's got a picture he's with the logo from Apple, from Coca-Cola, from Nike. These are category creators. But what I want to emphasize here is it's not always the best product that wins. In so many cases, it's the best marketer that wins. And I think that's the case here. Um, I, I, I actually believed so much in this, kind of like if you ever remember Victor Kayam, loved the shaver so much that he ended up buying the, the company. Um, we, we liked this one so much that in 2010, we invested. We really believed in that one. Let me, let me just show you how much we believed in that. They were doing $15 million of revenue. They were neck and neck with the GoPro. Neck and neck, can you imagine? This little company that you've never heard of was neck and neck with, with GoPro, basically in, in, in size and scale, about 40 employees. 2011, they come to my office and they say, hey, would you like to invest? Well, we were number seven on the Inc. 500 list. Um, we're within just several million dollars of this other leader that you've now heard of, which is GoPro, and I had. My wife had actually, in that time, bought me one of these contour cameras. I went heli skiing. I did a header over a 10-foot cliff. I guess that's not really a cliff, is it? But a 10-foot boulder and lost my camera. So I wanted one. They came into my office and they gave me a camera, so I listened for sure, right? Um, but they had a great story and very compelling. But I knew that this was gonna be one of those category creating stories where someone is going to create a category. And guess what? As you guys know, the history plays out, it wasn't this company. It wasn't Contra. But what do you do when you're the largest stakeholder in a business like this? You guys can see it, I didn't hide it. You know, we, this, they go into the Apple stores, which is a nice compliment to a company like Contour. You're in the Apple stores. It does seem a little sleeker than that box that we were seeing with a, with a GoPro. We had better technology, but again, no growth. What happens in 2013? Out of business. I just placed another seven figure check. This is about a million and a half dollar check that I had just written in the summer of 2013. Six weeks later, I get a call from the investment group where I, where I placed. This is the only indirect investment that we've ever done. If you understand that, I was doing it through another private equity and they placed it. We don't do that anymore, needless to say. Um, that they were out of business. We had just written them this great big check. Collectively, we had, you know, I think about $5 million into it. They're going out of business. Unless you write another million and a half dollar check. Guys, what do you do? What do you do? You're shaking your head. Let it die, is that easy? When was the last time you guys let $5 million die? <laughs> right? So you've got a choice to make, and we had to make that choice, right? So we either have to come in and we have to save this, 
the struggling business that's getting their, it, it handed to them by a GoPro at this point, right? Uh, GoPro went on to do, I, I think this year they did a quarter of a million in sales, a half billion, or I'm sorry, a quarter of a billion, a half billion, and then 2014, I think this last year, they did a billion dollars of sales. Meanwhile, we've got no growth, 30 million of sales, and they're out of business. So what do you do, guys? Well, I know what we did, and I'll tell you, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll spoil the case study for a moment. Um, we decided that as a team that we would let it run over a cliff. We would say goodbye to our $5 million investment and we would try to figure this out as we were in a receiver's office. This company went into receivership and we had an opportunity to buy it back and we did. Anybody, this is public information so you might know this, you might not, but do you, anybody have an idea of what we paid for that company, buying it back? $1.8 million. That, what we paid for it was less than what their inventory was worth. Good idea? You're, there's, there's kind of an ambivalent head back there, like, oh, I don't know. You're right, by the way, you're right. I don't know, it sounded good to me at the time, but I, I'll tell you what, going into the following year, so that took place the fall of 2013, going into the following year, this is hard stuff, guys. We, I, I'm not a, a turnaround expert by any stretch or by, you know, by, by any skill or training, am I a turnaround guy? I'm, I'm a guy who's built businesses. But picking something off the floor and retooling and redeveloping relationships with you know, manufacturers and distributors and partners that have been burned in one way or another, how do you do it? How do you go about this? So that's what we spent 2014 doing. Um, and I'll tell you what we did you know, through this reboot and IP strategy is that we went back and did what we do really well. And in my office, I have a rel relatively small office, just about a dozen of us. But there are four in this legal department, so a third of us in this legal department said, listen, this, is, this might not be a business that's going to win in the GoPro race or in the action cam space, but you know what, guys? We have over 40 patents, and what are those worth? And you know what those patents had to do with? That wireless connectivity between the camera and a smartphone. That GPS, kind of a cool thing. I mean, that, that Wi-Fi feature, I mean, all these camera makers are charging 70 to $100 just for that one feature alone. So what's that worth to a company? What's it worth? Well, I don't know, but I'll tell you what the markets have said since the day that we filed a lawsuit against GoPro on, or uh, I'm sorry, since the day that that patent was issued to us, we got the notice of allowance on November 18th, um, GoPro stock is down 45%. So certainly somebody in the market believes that there's value in that. Uh, while we, we haven't figured exactly what that looks like, there's certainly market value attributed to that. So we'll see how this one plays out, but we have a lot of respect for our friends at, at GoPro because guess what they did? They created the category. They did exactly what we couldn't do. Even with what I believe was a better technology, the patent protection, a better camera. I mean, guys, really, in the 21st century, if you're gonna do something that has to do with aerofluid hydrodynamics, do you wanna wear a box on your head? Or do you wanna wear something that's aerodynamic? I mean, that seems like a pretty simple, simple argument, but guess what? They built a great brand, and I tip my hat to people for doing that. Um, so we'll see how this story plays out. But that's, first of all, how not to build a brand, okay? We clear? Don't do, but, but follow the playbook of, of, a, of a GoPro. They've done a fantastic job. Um, so you've got the idea, you've got, you know, whatever um, product you're bringing to market. Here's my shout out for Vu-Ray. Thank you very much for the, for the um, band right here, we're uh, supporting the local, this is a clothing apparel company, right? So you've got the pro product, uh, like Vure, I was given this at dinner beforehand, I appreciate that. Now it's about execution. This is, this is Cynthia Montgomery, one of the best strategies I've, strategists I've ever met. Um, and she talks about it all being about strategy and execution. And I believe that. You can have, as we just saw, what is probably known as the best product. But if you can't execute you can't do anything. You'll never be known as a brand. You won't be important in someone's life. Um, and ultimately, you won't be profitable. So know what you do well and do it. Do more of it. Scale it. 
um, pretty interesting to listen to a person like that. Now, um, I want to talk to you about the market really quick. Anybody been seeing these, these business magazine covers recently? There's been a lot of talk of unicorns. What does it mean? Bloomberg Business Week, right? This is talking about Bitcoin specifically, okay? And then you, you've got Fortune Magazine talking about unicorns. What is this, guys? What are they asking? Did anybody read this? This is, this is from a week or so ago. This is the beginning of February where they're talking about these unicorns. They're talking about today, um, there are 80 startup companies, at least 80. And, and there were some that I knew of that weren't even mentioned in here. Um, that are local or regional, that have an enterprise value attributed to them of at least a billion dollars or more. Do you know how many there were like this in the last decade, a decade previous, in the whole 10 years? How many do you think? Two? Pretty good guess. You know, less than half than, I, I'm sorry, it less than a quarter of what's of what's been been listed here. It was it was just over. Um, it, I, I think it was right around 20 that they are listing over the last decade. So you can think of the Googles and you can think of the Yahoos and the several others that were raising money early on before they went public when they were still considered startups. But today we have 80. What does that say to you guys? What does that mean to 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 a guy like me that's an investor? in markets or, or a believer in markets and, and what's taking place. What, is, what, what are we getting out of it? Why are we seeing all these unicorns, if you will, follow me for a moment? This is my chance to ask you guys a question. Any thoughts? Any brave ones? Right. I mean, are they hatching a real baby in this thing? Oh, okay. So the, the thought is, and the, the comment is, for those of you that are, that are listening in, um, that those are excellent ideas. So that's why they might have a, a, an attributed high enterprise value. Um, these are ideas that didn't exist 10 years ago. So that's probably another reason. There's just a lot of cool things happening. Is that a fair assessment of what you've said? Okay. Other thoughts? Okay. Okay, so some ease of execution. They've got the ability to execute is what's being said. Um, you know, things are changing in the, mar the market. We've, uh, again, just going back to the ability to make something happen. Um, so technology might be speeding up. Is that a fair assessment of what you've said? Okay. Any other thoughts? Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that that's I appreciate that point. The the point is, where's the bubble? That's the question that's being asked, right? Where where is it? Where are we? Listen, there are always going to be cycles in markets, and I don't want to talk macro and microeconomics, but but as we're looking at this why is it such a huge range versus what's taken place in the last, you know, even 20 years for, for that matter. So it, it does speak to markets. Uh, and the reason I bring this up is, are these powerful brands yet? Do you know these brands as we talk about it? You, you might know of Pluralsight here in Utah. You might know of Qualtrics because they've spoken here and I really like them. They, they office a block away from me and they're dear friends. But are these billion dollar companies changing the world quite yet? And the answer right now is they're not. They're not. There's a lot of capital on the sidelines. There's a, a lot of interesting ideas. And now it is back to the comment in the back about execution. So they're being rewarded maybe in advance. And I think there are going to be a lot of real big winners of these 80 that we're talking about. But I also think there are going to be a lot, a lot of losers in there. I can't pick them. I'm not smart enough. But I just, as we're talking about this, I think it's, it's worthwhile noting that it doesn't matter what the valuation is, it's about the execution behind that and making sure that that brand 
comes to market and changes people's lives, right? So our asymmetry in what we do is we're trying to build brands is, is as follows. You've got a lot of angel and venture uh, 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 investors on this side. So you've got, you know, in the Salt Lake Valley, Peterson Ventures, Innoventure, Signal Peak, Pelion, Mercado, really smart people deploying other people's capital. They take their 2% management fee and a 20% of the carry, 20% of the upside, right? These are smart people doing really good things. On the other side, you've got, again, to the Peterson family there, you've got Peterson Partners, you've got Aries Capital, great people, great friends. I know we've got family members here uh, of Aries Partners. And uh, Solomera, great group. That's Mitt Romney's family office. Sorensen Capital, fantastic group. Huntsman Gay Global Capital, have to give a shout out to the business school here, of course. Um, and Dakota Pacific and, and others. And right there in the middle, you've got this great big space of growth equity. And there just aren't that many players out there that are in this space. And growth equity, just so that we all understand, is sort of where we play. Angel and venture, very early stage. This right here is your growth equity, one to five million dollars of EBITDA. Somebody that is profitable. And I, as an entrepreneur, and I've said this before, and I've talked to some of you here about it, that I think the most difficult part in any business is from the, the very beginning, this conception, the, the thought of the idea to a million dollars of earnings. Not revenue, earnings. Because after that million dollars of earnings, you can scale. You can afford some systems. You can, you know, you, you, you can bring in the right talent. You can do a lot of things once you're profitable. But it's that zero to a million dollars where people are really learning about their business and understanding if it's actually gonna be viable or not. And so we come in, once that, that business has proven themselves viable, and we add some growth equity, and we put a little fuel in the gas tank, and we help mentor and shepherd these entrepreneurs in what they're doing, and help actually then build the brand. Not the same way that what took place with the Contour, but some of these other brands. And let me tell you just a little bit about our thesis and what we do. Um, it's a five-point thesis. The first is what I've explained to you. It's one to five million dollars of EBITDA. Second, solid management. We are going to invest in people that are solid, that we believe in, um, that can execute and do the kinds of things that will help build a, a, an enterprise. Three, we like them here in this region. We love the Mountain West region. We're bullish on Utah. We love what's coming out of this valley here. Um, and and it's, it's fantastic to see all the wonderful technology that's taking place here in the state, all the wonderful manufacturing that's taking place here in the state, and we're bullish on that. Um, defensible IP, that means that they built a moat or they are building a moat around their business. Think of it that way. They want to be able to protect it against somebody else coming in and stealing their idea. So it's gotta be defensible. And then lastly, of course, we believe that there are infinite opportunities in finite capital. And if that's the case, we're gonna, we're gonna bet on big wins. We're gonna, we're gonna de-risk our capital as we're placing that, but we're gonna go for billion dollar enterprises where we build real brands. This is an example of one of those. They came to us with virtually no sales in 2010. Um, in the beginning of 2011, after saying no to them three different times, this business, True Science, was born. We placed the first $2 million allocation with them in an, in an interesting structure. They came back to us. Six weeks later said, hey, um, you know how you were helping us with our inventory? Well, we need $4 million more. And $4 million more turned into $6 million more. And by the end of that year, we had $12 million that we had placed with this business. Well, what had they done with it? That first year, they did almost $40 million of sales after we had invested in them. Second, almost 80, then 134, about $170 million last year. This is a bona fide billion dollar business today by virtue of what they do. Selling a quarter million dollars, these businesses, the, the last comp that uh, went public in our space was doing $60 million of revenue, had $90 million of debt, had been around for 12 years. What do you think the market cap was on that business? Any guesses? Any guesses on what a market cap might be on a business that's doing $60 million of revenue in the pet space? Did you say that? 1.2 billion? It, that's a, it's a great guess. It's not outside of the realm of reasonability, uh, of reason there. That's, that's a business that came out at a $500 million market cap within days went to 700. It's kind of settled back in. But you think about that. 
they had almost $100 million of debt. They're trading at, you know, within days of going public at about a 12 times sales. So what's a, a business like this worth? They did it, we did it in a third of the time. We have no debt to speak of and we're at least four times their size this year. So what's this one worth? Because I like that trajectory. I'll bet on that trajectory all day long. This is how we build brands. Is we do it fast and I'll tell you what, this had very little to do with anything other than just the right execution. This business looked at an opportunity. These are fast operators, they never miss. And when Walmart asks for X, they get X plus from the, this group. And they were named the, the uh, supplier of the year by Walmart um, it, last year. And it's, it's, it's a, a nice thing for them to say about a new organization like this, but it really speaks to how we operate our business. Um, let me tell you about Cures really quickly in building this brand. This is certainly a brand you've never heard of, okay? But this is one that we acquired out of a technology transfer office of, of another Utah university. When we acquired this, it took us several months, almost a year to acquire this. This is a, this is a business that we got the right asset. We seeded it with capital, and then we brought in world-class talent. We brought in the former um, Secretary of, the Health, of Health and Human Services former head of the EPA on that board. Um, one of the founders of Bain Capital is on that board. Uh, one of the, the, the directors and founders of Eli Lilly's drug development arm. Is that the kind of guy that you want or the kind of team that you want when you're building out drugs and drug development and experiment? I think so. And it's world class and that's what's really helped this business grow. Now that we've built out that board and secured the right kind of talent, We've, we're now doing an institutional raise in that business. And that's a business that's a year and about four months old. That has gone from, you know, in just its early stage ideas, a little bit of technology to where it has 300 compounds. It has two novel, very, very, in a lot of ways, groundbreaking patents. And it's in the antimicrobial space. You know, you, you hear about superbugs, you, you hear about MRSA, or a hospital-acquired infection. Um, this is a very interesting technology. And a comp in that space, um, akin, probably five years ahead of what these guys are doing um, in solving sort of the microbial and bacteria problems that, that we're seeing in hospitals, in third world countries, around the world, where you know even a guy like um, the Prime Minister of Great Britain will say that even potentially a scratch in the 21st century is something that could potentially kill you because of the bacteria and the bacterial resistance that's out there. I don't want to bore you with the science that this is, but this is a business that a year and four months later is raising its first round of institutional capital at a $100 million pre-money valuation. And I think for us, that's how we build brands. And we think of this one in a lot of ways like the Intel inside. So you've got a Nike t-shirt, let's say. And that Nike t-shirt, when you sweat, how does it smell? Not great. I didn't hear anybody comment. You guys must smell great. Mine doesn't, okay? But Nike is interested in that because where does that smell come from? Bacteria. So it's, it's not just what happens in a hospital. It has an application on the sports field. It has an application in petroleum. So every time you send 100 million barrels of oil from Saudi Arabia through the Persian Gulf over to North America, you know, 5% of that cargo is lost to bacteria. Pretty cool application that if you could reverse that or kill the biofilms that are there, as well as the bacteria, that's a pretty interesting application for a business. So it's not just one application or two applications, we do this across the board. And that's how we help build th this brand. Um, these are just some of our investments to date. A company called MyFastBC, just a couple years old, about 150 full-time employees, helps speed up your computers remotely. Interesting business. They'll have 300 employees by the end of the year, thrilled about what they're doing and, and their growth. Contour, we talked about that one. I think we'll figure that one out. We sure hope. Cross your fingers for us, okay? Um, BetIQ, this is true science. Brand called Perfectly Posh, a direct sales organization, kind of party planning model here in Utah. HireVue, anybody heard of HireVue? That's a Sequoia deal where a large private equity firm placed money in that. We were the founding investors and helped build their original technology. OK Compare, and then Curza that we've talked about. Um, 
I, I want to open this up in just a couple minutes to uh, to questions. But first, I want to I, I want to tell you something that I learned when I was doing my dissertation. Um, I interviewed 17 people. Uh, it was my sample set, and every one of these people had one one thing in common, and that one thing in common was that they had either built a billion dollar business or they had had a billion dollars under management of assets under management, but they had either built or been a category creator or built something around a billion dollars, right? So I'm interviewing someone. One of, my, one of my samples was this guy right here. Anybody know who that is? Can you see? I'll give you some more pictures. Anybody know who that is now? Steve Young, right? So, so Steve, would you say he's a pretty competitive guy? I would. I'm asking the question that I wanted to know from everyone in the sample. And the question that I asked, and I didn't think much of it when I was asking, but it was my favorite question to ask when I was at ClearLink. And the question is this, do you, do you love to win or do you hate to lose? What'd you say? Love to win, that's the magnanimous answer, right? That's the generous, I love to win, it's all about love, right? It's all great, that's what he answered. He said, I love to win. Guess what happened 20 minutes later? And 20 minutes into the interview, he said, uh, James, this has been bugging me. I gotta stop you. I gotta go back to that question you asked me 20 minutes ago when you said, do you love to win or do you hate to lose? And he said, James, I gotta tell you, I just hate to lose. And you know what was so funny is I got a chance to interview his, his partner here. This is Jerry Rice. Same question. What do you think he said? What, what do you think? Easy, hate to lose. This was interesting to me because you would think that these guys that have won on the largest, you know, sort of stages in the world are guys that just love it for the love of the game and it's the right way to do it, right? No, for these guys, it was, it was more powerful for them to hate the loss. I think it's a powerful principle as you're thinking about building businesses, as you're thinking about your career. It's a powerful principle. What does it mean in this setting? I'm not sure. I'd like to do some more research. Um, but hating to lose has a power in and of itself. It's not just enough to love to win. You've got to hate that loss, that feeling of loss, whether it's in business or personally or whatever that might be. Um, lastly, four powerful principles that I've, I've learned. And I hope these aren't the last four on your little sheet there. Um, Beware of entitlement. I started in the summer sales game. 21 years ago, I went to work for a company then called Creative Marketing Concepts. Anybody ever heard of that business? Well, it's called Vivint now. Anybody heard of that one? Okay, you probably worked for it, right? Great business, right? But I have never met a more entitled group of people, including myself, than these summer sales reps. There's an entitlement there. More money than I probably deserve to, to make in a summer. You guys know the feeling, any of you guys? Yeah, right? Um, but there's a sense of entitlement there. And I, I would caution any of us, myself included, to not get caught in that entitlement. And, and that includes coming to a great university like this. The best thing about you should not be where you went to school. The best thing about you is yet to come. The best thing about you should not be that you went to XYZ school I've hired the guys that went to these same schools that I went to. And I fired a lot of these guys that went to those same schools. I love the scrappy. I love those that don't have that sense of entitlement that the best is yet to come. And I hope that that's, that's true for this group here. Two, cross the chasm. You see this chasm right here? I worked with a group called 1-800-Pharmacy. I'm not scared to say that name because we put a lot of money into this business. But guess what they never did? They never launched a live website. In the years that I served on the board, they never had the products, they had everything lined up and all the relationships and everything was set, but they never launched it. You know why? I believe it was because they were scared. But the only way you figure this out is if you will take the step and cross the chasm, get to the other side and find out what was wrong with it to begin with. Because there's always going to be something wrong. Invariably, there will be a problem. So run to the problem on that, cross the chasm. Three. Nail it and scale it. We love to say this at ClearLink. That was a big part of what we did on a daily basis. We did something really well, we would scale it up and ramp it. It's what we do in my business today. Nail it and then scale it. Fourth, fail fast. I know that sounds silly, 
to fail fast. Who wants to fail fast? Generally nobody. But the reality is, you do, good, I'm glad. I do too, but you want to, you want to fail in these small failures so you can loop around, adjust, and find the success around the corner. That's how you fail fast. Lastly, just wanna sh share this little family creed, okay? Because this is, this is the single best lesson I ever lear learned in my life. I talked to you about getting you know, these smelly potatoes thrown at me as a 12-year-old working. I worked at my house for my father doing odd jobs um, as I was growing up. And he would write me a check, and I think I made something the first year, I think I was making like $1.50 an hour. At the, end of the, at, at the end of the week, I got a 20 plus dollar check. And he wrote the check, and you know the little memo section that tells you what it's about? So if I had done a really great job and I had done everything that he asked me to do, labor and honor. Now if I hadn't done a good job, if I hadn't done what I said I would do, labor. It was just labor. And my challenge to all of you today, and as well as I challenge myself, don't let what you're doing in your future career, in your educational career, just be labor. Let it be labor and honor. And I really appreciate you letting me talk to you today. It's been a joy, and I look forward to coming back another time. We'll turn it over to, thanks. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Uh, we'll turn it over to Q&A now. And I will take as much time as, as you have, so. Please, and tell me your name and where you're from, and I'll repeat so that those on the other side can hear. Unless you have a microphone, you can. James from Arizona. Hi, James from Arizona. Um, that, was, that was an interesting transition for me. I thought we were gonna sell the business in 2008. I brought in a successor, um, a, a stakeholder of the business that was very qualified and did a fantastic job um, to, so that I wouldn't sort of have those golden handcuffs that are usually associated with the sale of a business. Turns out we didn't sell the business in 2008. The world fell apart and so did all of our offers. And so I had two years to kind of figure out what I would do for the rest of my life. And so I set up an office in New York on 56th and 6th and studied out all kinds of opportunities and learned about this um, growth equity model. And that's what we do today. So good question, James. Thanks. Other questions, please. Yeah, it was, it was a long process, longer than probably it would have been. Uh, the question is, what was the process like starting a company like ClearLink? So thank you for the question. Um, it was a longer process because we didn't take outside capital. This really just came from what my fiance, w becoming my wife, was earning. And she had a great paycheck and we were able to do that. And so we, we were small and I had small goals. And I shared some of those goals with the group earlier that, you know, all I wanted was just to be able to sell, you know, just over a dozen of those things a day. And then you ratchet up your goals and ratchet up your goals. And it's, it's a pretty gratifying experience to look back on. Good question, thank you. Other questions, please. Yes. In your name? This is Eric from Logan. All right, we like Logan. Mm -hmm. um, is it pretty much the same ballgame as what you do with other things? So the, the question is, uh, we're, we're asked, I'm asked about um, starting up sort of a biotech or medicinal related companies. So the advice about those, um, is, that, is that an accurate assessment of the question? Um, those are hard, right? So it, those are kind of binary. You know, it's either gonna be huge or it's gonna be nothing, right? So we tried to protect our capital in something like that and made sure that we knew what we were you know, getting into relative to the science. Um, but then I think the advice that I would give is, is kind of the playbook that we're utilizing right now, that we don't go after one vertical, like straight through antimicrobials within hospitals or, or a drug development or drug, drug discovery. We'll go after commercial applications. 
Um, you know, so we'll, we'll go after a, a Nike relationship. We'll go after industrial applications, all kinds of verticals. And so we don't just put one, you know, all of our eggs in one basket. Thank you. Please. Hi, Casey. This is Casey from Park City. Yeah, um, the, the question is, Casey's experience has been that call centers have been pretty negative environments. You know, you can kind of get lost in cubicle HE double hockey sticks, right? <laughs> right, I, I've done that, I've worked those before. And I think that was probably the reason why we created a bit of an asymmetry or a differentiation was that I had worked that job. I had had that experience and we were never gonna do the road cubicles. There were these pods, right? They were pretty sexy little pods, right? It was, it was a good looking business and that was important to me because I never wanted it to feel like, oh, I'm going to work. And, and really at the end of the day, we didn't want to make it a call center. This is really a technology company that just happens to answer the phone for a lot of people. We weren't calling out, we weren't looking for new subscribers per se with the outbound callers that, you know, that people would dread. Um, this is people calling in and just needing help from an organization that actually sold products to them. So, Yes, while it certainly fits the definition of a call center, we always tried to aim this towards more of a technology company. And, and, and you know, that, I think that's what made a lot of difference for us. So, good question, thanks. James Davenport. Uh, From Salt Lake City. Uh, you, you obviously wrote it Um, it's, a, it's a great question. It's kind of that age old question. Is the experience more valuable than the, 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 the books and, and spending time in a place like this? And, and for what I do, and I knew that I wanted to do what I'm doing now. And I'll tell you what, before I walk in, into about every, um, every meeting, the people that I'm meeting with know my bio, they know my background, they know the companies that I've been involved with. And so for me, it was, it was a credibility question. Um, if I were ready to go sort of sail off into the sunset and, you know, sip alcohol-free margaritas for the rest of my life, it would have been a different story. Um, but um, for what I'm doing today, it was, it was imperative. And, and I really value that traditional and the atraditional education. So thanks for the question. Please, Ashley. This is Ashley from North Ogden. That's a great question. Um, the, the question is, how, what role does my wife play in our business now? What role did she play early on as that investor? I, mean, I, I think if my wife had the choice then, which she did have the choice, of course, but you know, um, she wouldn't have chosen that as her first choice to invest in, in this company. But what she did was ultimately, of course, invest in me. Um, I think she chooses not to be involved on a day-to-day -day basis. She's really good at raising kids, and that's what she loves, that's what she wanted to do, but she could no doubt run the business better than I do. She's that qualified, she's that good. So, um, I, and, and speaking of women in general, we will always, if we can, hire women over men if we, if we can. That's, that's terrible. I hope that's not a lawsuit, is it? But we, we, we really enjoy the diversity in the marketplace. We don't see enough women, I think is what I'm really trying to say. So I hope that answers the question. Thank you. Back to you. I didn't. I sold that company. So the question is, where did I raise the assets to then deploy? And the answer is, when we sold ClearLink, that money is what we used. So this is a traditional. This is typically you would go out and raise a fund and redeploy people's money. You would charge a two and twenty on, on those fees, kind of like these other firms we talked about. Uh, but that's not how it works I in our family office, and that's why that's what Wall Street calls a family office is when it's families deploying their own capital. Yeah. 
so the question is, how do we incorporate labor and honor together in what we do? I, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. Um, uh, I'm in a place where we want to keep our office relatively small. There are no bragging rights in employees. We've had hundreds and, and thousands throughout all of our organizations collectively. Um, it'll probably never be a larger organization than a dozen of us. I, I feel like if Warren Buffett can keep his office that small, we can do the same thing. Um, so I've got the luxury to choose a, a really great group of people that, that really live that way, you know, top to bottom. I, I'm not a believer in, it's just business. How many times have you guys heard that? It's just business, or it's just this, or it's not. It's all personal to me. It's all, it's all one, and I can't compartmentalize my life into this or this or this. It's, it's all the same. It's life. So, please. This is Alexander from Provo. I was interested in how to do it. What is workable right now in the way that we can do it? Because all of us are coming up out of the pandemic. Sure. And we still got a few more years to go. Yeah. No, that's fine. No, that's yeah, where is Contour is primarily outside of the United States. Has, has in fact, we actually beat GoPro in several markets throughout the world. Um, the, the question is, where is Contour today? And so we're, we're mostly, you know, throughout the world. We have almost no footprint here in the U.S. right now, except for online, at, but not in retail stores. So, but that'll change. We aim, we aim for that to change. We sure hope so. All that execution, right? Please. Hi, Garrett. From where? Okay, this is Garrett White from Washington. You don't, you don't want to know. He's asking what I did for my undergraduate. I no, I studied geography because I wanted to travel. <laughs> it's terrible. <laughs> you know, it was terrible. I had a little geology in there, a little poli sci, but that's, yeah, that's what I studied. So I had to go back and learn in grad school about business. I, I couldn't speak business, and it's a wonderful universal language. It will allow you to be involved in any industry, and that's why we can be industry agnostic is because we have the ability to to you know, sort of cross channels that way. So yeah, unfortunately, I wasn't as smart as you guys to get into the business school where I was going. So other questions, please. Any questions from um, online or other places, please? Hey, Andrew from Los Angeles. Yeah, yeah. so the question is, do we have a strategy when we enter into a new portfolio company or invest in a new company? Probably the, extending into that question, do we have a decision as to when we exit also? You know, um, yes and no. Uh, and the reality is, right now, we're so heads down in a transaction with one of the portfolio companies, I don't think we would even have the bandwidth to allocate to new companies, but guess what, we will. We've, we've sort of said, you know, we're, we're not going to with the first six months of what we're doing, but we likely will. And we're still looking at deals. I still see a, a deal every day. Uh, we don't want to waste people's time, but we've chosen some really good deals going into the latter part of this year. So, yeah. Other questions, please. Yes. And your name is? Oh, my name is Mike from Jordan. My, Mike from Jordan. Great. Yeah. How did that play out for you? Yeah. So the question is, how did I incorporate authenticity? I talked a lot about authenticity, and how did I do that, right? So um, I, what we do today, part of the authenticity is I made a fundamental decision in our latest firm to put my name on the door. Um, I, I was at a hotel. If any of you know the Wynn Hotel in Las Vegas. Everywhere I went, I asked, you know, no, I can carry my bags. No, Mr. Wynn wouldn't like you to do that. Uh, I can go get my car myself. No, Mr. Wynn wouldn't like you to do that. And I realized right there in that moment that there's something about that culture about, you know, blame it on Mr. Wynn or blame it on whomever it is, the good things, right? That you always want to be about those good things and that that, you know, carries through a name. And I wanted to be accountable to that name. Clearlink is an anagram for my last name, Clark, and my wife's maiden name, Earl. So that was our 
sly attempt of trying to be accountable and be, being authentic. Um, you know, we just, it, it's, we, we can't pretend not to like our people because we do. We're, we're just, that, that's who it, we actually care about these, these folks. The worst part of my job is letting people go. Um, and it, it's genuinely painful for, for a guy like me. So everything that we do, we hope that we're all authentic. So thanks for the question. Okay, one more question, please. Make it a good one, no pressure. Yes, please. I'm sure it is. Hi, this is McKay from Layton. Should I say Layton or Layton? Well, you can say Layton. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay. How does the timeline fit together? Yeah, it sounds like a CSI episode or something. <laughs> We're fitting this all together. Yeah, um, pretty simple. I, I uh, didn't go the traditional route, as you can figure out. I didn't finish Oxford until two years ago. Went back and did an executive program where I was doing that. I was also an executive program at HBS. Um, and then I, a, as soon as I left BYU, I started um, this first company. It was called iSatellite. And from iSatellite, we went to starting Clearlink. And that was that direct sales story of our company. So yeah, a little simple when you say it that way, right? I hope so. But it doesn't really tie it all together. We'll talk offline later. Thank you, everyone, so much. Really appreciate it.